The Cadillac Service Department presents a roundtable program on the electronic detectives of the lighting system, the automatic controls that raise and lower headlight beams, turn lights on and off, and even escort you into the house. The two light detectors that can be called the private eyes. Private eye number one, the relocated and considerably improved Guidematic, the inconspicuous private eye that for 1964 looks through this prism lens in the left front fender. With the all new photo tube assembly positioned where it is out of sight to the driver, but much more in sight of the approaching headlights as well as the tail lights of the car ahead. Its vision is better confined to the road ahead, therefore it's less affected by street lights and highway signs. Also, Moving the photo tube out from behind the tinted windshield makes it more sensitive to another car's red taillights. This new fender-mounted guidematic can only be installed at the factory and can be ordered on all models except the Fleetwood 75s and the commercial chassis. These and dealer-installed units retain the dash-mounted position. More about the new guidematic in a minute. But first, let's introduce private eye number two, Cadillac's Twilight Sentinel. What we see here is the dash-mounted photocell unit, which looks up through the windshield and measures the amount of skylight to determine when it's dark enough to turn the headlights on. In daylight, the lights are off. When it's dark, the Twilight Sentinel automatically turns them on. Provisions have also been made for the driver to control when the lights will go on as darkness approaches. For example, those who like to delay turning on the lights till as late as possible would turn the cap on the photocell to the late position. In this position, the photocell is fully exposed, thereby seeing as much light as possible. Turning the cap in the early direction partly covers up the photocell, making it see less light, and the lights will go on that much earlier. The Twilight Sentinel, in addition to automatically controlling the lights as determined by outside light conditions, also allows the driver to use his headlights as well as cornering lights if desired to light his path from the car to the house. The automatic turning off of the lights, in fact, can be delayed by any amount, up to a minute or more, as determined by rotating the knob on the Twilight Sentinel's control panel. The panel also contains a push-pull switch for automatic or manual control. In either position, the headlights can always be turned on at the regular headlight switch. Twilight Sentinel and Guidematic, two separate options which, when ordered together, make the lighting system fully automatic. In fact, the owner may only set the controls once and then never touch them again, except for unusual conditions like going through a tunnel where headlights aren't permitted. These two units are also linked by a third private eye, the new Guidematic Analyzer, a private eye that the owner may never see or hear about, but one that allows us to see what's going right and what's going wrong inside the components of the Twilight Sentinel and Guidematic. This Guidematic Analyzer is designed to take full advantage of the service features of the fender-mounted photo tube unit, which has a built-in aiming level and test bulb. Also, the factory set dim and hold sensitivity adjustments are sealed inside this unit. The test readings for each unit are marked on the label. This means, for one thing, that it is no longer necessary to replace the amplifier and the photo tube as a matched pair. Either can be replaced independently of the other. As in the past, of course, our job is one of diagnosis, to see which of the five components is at fault, so we'll know which one to replace. And with the new Guidematic Analyzer, we have a simpler, less time-consuming sensitivity test and diagnosis procedure, both for the Guidematic system and for the Twilight Sentinel. And you'll find that turning the dial on the analyzer to completely check out the system is no more complicated than dialing a telephone. But now let's take a look at the five components of the Guidematic system. First, there's the photo tube unit, the real private eye that scans the road for lights ahead. Sealed inside the unit is the photo tube itself, plus a pre-amplifier assembly, which builds up the electrical signal on its way to the amplifier assembly through a 10-foot-long shielded cable. Inside the amplifier, you can see the two tubes and the sensitive relay. Because of its factory calibration, we service the amplifier as an assembly. 
The remaining three components of the Guidematic system are the power relay, the driver sensitivity control, and the foot switch. The power relay is the trigger for high or low beam. The sensitivity control lets the driver determine when the lights will dim for oncoming cars. And the foot switch lets him choose between low beam and automatic operation. It also provides an override action that can force the lights to high beam when in automatic position. And now that we've met the players, and before we take out the analyzer, let's just quickly review some preliminary checkout steps to see if the system is operational. Ready for the countdown? Okay. First, get the Guidematic operating by turning the headlights on and allowing 30 seconds for the system to warm up. During this time, the lights should stay on low beam in either position of the foot switch. Now, after the amplifier has warmed up, the first test is for override action. Simply put the foot switch in automatic position. Then test the override action by pushing it part way down. This should give you four spots on the wall. If you're in a lighted area, the lights should switch back to low beam when you take your foot away. Next, check the driver sensitivity control. Turning the control ring to the right to the far position increases the sensitivity of the phototube and the light should stay on low beam. Turning it all the way left forces the lights into high beam. If all goes as it should, turn the sensitivity control ring to its central position with the arrow straight up and move out of the car. Now, cover the lens on the fender with the palm of your hand. With the phototube in the dark, the lights should go to high beam, just as they should on a dark highway. Take your hand away and the lights should switch to low beam. This proves that the system cycles properly. But if the owner isn't satisfied with its sensitivity, we call in our analyzer to see if the dim and hold sensitivity still agree with the factory calibration. First, however, a couple of preliminary checks are necessary. As step one, check the level of the phototube. Make sure the car is normally loaded and on a level floor. Bounce it at each wheel to get it to its normal standing height. Then check the built-in bubble level on the phototube unit. Adjust the vertical aim if necessary. Also, make sure the phototube unit is cool to the touch since it can't tell the difference between excess heat and excess light. Now with these items checked off, turn the driver sensitivity control to off position. Start the engine and give the amplifier about five minutes to stabilize itself. During this time, you can cover the phototube lens with black masking tape. And while waiting, check out the analyzer. First, turn the voltage control knob all the way to the left and hook up the power supply wires to the battery. Red clip to positive and black clip to negative. Turn the function selector knob momentarily to position one and the voltmeter should read full scale. Now, ground the red voltage output wire. Dial position one again, and turn up the voltage control to make sure the short indicator bulb lights up as it should. If it does, the analyzer is ready to go to work. Turn the voltage control knob all the way to the left and connect the red voltage output wire to the green test bulb feed wire from the phototube unit. In position one, the voltmeter should show about two volts, which proves that the test bulb inside the phototube unit is lighting. Check the phototube label for the specified dim voltage and turn the voltage control knob to obtain this reading. This is the first step in finding the particular setting of the driver sensitivity control that will cause the phototube to dim the lights with exactly this voltage applied to the test bulb. Turn the driver control ring to the right very slowly to find the exact point where the headlights switch to low beam. Leave the control ring at this point and go back to the analyzer. Back off the analyzer voltage until high beam is obtained. Then slowly increase the voltage while watching the meter. Read the voltage at the instant the lights dim. This should agree with the factory setting. Readjust the driver control if you have to until the dim voltage is correct. Now, 
back off the test bulb voltage slowly until the headlights jump to high beam and note the voltage at this point. This is the hold voltage and should fall within the specified range for hold voltage written on the photo tube label. If the hold voltage is within the specified range, you can disconnect the analyzer. Everything is A-OK. -okay. And removing the masking tape puts Guidematic back on its own. By these operational checks, we have seen the Guidematic through all its normal operations and made sure they are normal. That is, we've seen how the system works. However, before we go on to the diagnosis of anything that isn't normal, let's see why it works the way it does. By tracing the system backwards, starting with the headlights. Normally, the headlights are in high beam and stay that way until we energize the power relay. The colors used in these diagrams, by the way, match the color coding of the wiring. That's why the power relay is colored green to show it's normally in high beam. The foot switch tells the power relay when to switch to low beam by sending it a signal through the purple wire. The foot switch gets this message from one of two sources. Through a black wire from the amplifier assembly when it's in automatic position or through a gray wire from the power supply when it's in low beam position. Let's leave the foot switch in automatic position and add the sensitive relay, which is part of the amplifier assembly. Normally, in its relaxed position, this sensitive relay sends a low beam signal through the foot switch to snap the power relay into low beam position. But the amplifier itself, which controls the sensitive relay, normally sends out a high beam command. This overrules the sensitive relay and shuts off its signal, letting the power relay spring back to high beam. The phototube and preamplifier assembly serve as the private eye for the amplifier. Voltage signals travel from the amplifier through the green and black wires in the shielded cable to the preamp tube. In the dark, however, the phototube does not conduct current to complete the circuit, and hence the preamp tube is shut off, leaving the amplifier, and hence the entire system, on high beam. When light hits the phototube, a chain reaction starts. The phototube completes the circuit to ground, turning on the preamp tube. The preamp then sends a signal through the white wire that shuts off the amplifier. The sensitive relay then springs back to low beam position and sends its signal through the foot switch to the power relay, forcing it into low beam position. The owner has two controls. One is the driver sensitivity control ring which operates a rheostat to vary the strength of the preamp signal in the white wire, thus controlling the sensitivity of the system. The other control is the manual override. From the foot switch, through the red wire to the amplifier, which can force the system temporarily to high beam, regardless of light shining on the phototube. To avoid erratic action in switching between high beam and low beam, another override in the system controls the dim sensitivity. When the system is on high beam, the sensitive relay sends a signal back through the red wire in the cable to the preamp tube, reducing the sensitivity to light and tending to keep the system on high beam. When the system is on low beam, the extra override is gone. This lets the phototube and preamp assembly work at full sensitivity to hold the lights on low beam. The difference between dim and hold sensitivity makes the system resist changing 
to avoid erratic action. We'll put this information to work out in the shop as soon as the operator turns the record. And now, to translate circuiting into diagnosis, the first thing to do is turn on the headlights at the manual switch. Make sure that the battery is getting through to the headlights and taillights. Next, we should check all the harness connections at the foot switch and power relay. But that's no cinch, since the power relay isn't too easy to get to. So here's an easier way to check it, sort of by remote control. Reach into the glove box, upward and to the left. Find the blue wire that feeds the guidematic amplifier and remove the four amp fuse. This should convert the system to manual operation. Now, the foot switch ought to shift the lights up and down between high and low beams like any other dimmer switch. If it does, then we know the power relay is okay because all five harness connections plus ground and the relay itself are all checked out by this test, leaving only the foot switch connections to check individually. How about that? Another important preliminary check is to test the four amp fuse with a test light to make sure it hasn't any hidden defect. Then replace the fuse for one more foot switch check. The red wire leading to the foot switch is the override control. Grounding this wire should force the lights to high beam as a check on the foot switch operation. After you've fully checked out the foot switch and power relay, start the engine and let it idle. Then move to the front of the car. Now we're ready to hook up the guidematic analyzer for diagnosis checks. Since the analyzer will take the place of the phototube unit, disconnect the gray shielded cable from the phototube and plug the analyzer's photo simulator cable into it. Also, hook up the analyzer's power supply wires to the battery, the same as before. From here on, it's downhill all the way as we close in on the amplifier and its 10-foot cable from both directions. These items, together with the driver control and sensitive relay, are all we have left to test since the balance of the system has already been checked out. Turn the function selector knob to position one, and the lights should be on upper beam, as it says right on the analyzer dial. Turn the knob to position two, and the lights should drop to lower beam. Keep that shop manual handy to look up what to do in case the system doesn't respond as it should. Turn the knob to position three, and the headlights should switch momentarily to upper beam, then drop back to lower beam almost immediately. So far, if the system responds correctly, we've checked out the driver control and sensitive relay and all four wires in the shielded cable. The lights should be in upper beam in positions four and five while we check the voltage readings in the green and black wires. If necessary, we can eliminate the 10-foot shielded cable by plugging the analyzer directly into the amplifier and quickly dialing the five positions again. These tests directly check everything but the phototube assembly. If we get the rest of the system working perfectly with the analyzer plugged in, but it won't work with the phototube, that's how we'd know when it's necessary to replace the phototube unit. And that about wraps up the guidematic system. But don't pack up the analyzer yet since this master of diagnosis can do an equally effective job for us on the Twilight Sentinel. You may have noticed that these two systems don't interfere with each other at all when testing them. That's because they are connected end to end, from battery to Twilight Sentinel to guidematic to headlights, just like the conventional headlight switch and foot dimmer switch, and they can be operated just as independently. The Twilight Sentinel is much simpler than the guidematic, since it consists of only two units, a photocell and an amplifier, and each is serviceable only as a complete assembly. Nevertheless, you'll appreciate them more if you know what's inside them. The photocell is the heart of this assembly. Light enters through a window in the cap. When light fades, as at sundown, the resistance of the photocell increases, and the amplifier is prompted to turn the lights on. The amplifier assembly consists of a transistorized amplifier, a sensitive relay, a power relay, and a time delay circuit. 
Its job, of course, is to turn the car lights on or off as commanded by the photocell. The amplifier is factory calibrated by means of a small rheostat and can only be serviced as an assembly. As we did with the guidematic, let's construct a block diagram of the Twilight Sentinel to see why it operates as it does. As we can see here, the Sentinel power relay on the left duplicates the job of the conventional headlight switch on the right. Either one can turn on the lights since they are connected in parallel, but both must be off to turn the lights off. Of course, for our purposes here, we are only concerned with the on-off operation by means of the power relay. The power relay mounted inside the amplifier case controls headlights and taillights through different contacts. Headlights draw power from the red circuit through a 20 amp circuit breaker in the amplifier case, duplicating the breaker in the regular light switch. Starting this year, tail lights, cornering lights, and instrument lights get power through a brown circuit, including a new 25 amp tail light fuse located in the fuse block above the parking brake. Like Guidematic, the Sentinel needs a sensitive relay to operate the power relay. The sensitive relay at the upper right is turned on and off by the amplifier. These three units are on or off at the same time, which makes it simpler to follow the action. The power supply to the amplifier comes by way of the yellow wire from the ignition switch. So the Sentinel will start working whenever the engine is started. Being transistorized, this amplifier needs no warm-up time. The photocell, because it is a variable resistor, is linked to the amplifier by two wires to form a complete circuit. In darkness, the photocell's high resistance blocks the current flow. The amplifier is free to turn on the sensitive relay, which turns on the power relay, to turn on the car lights. In daylight, just the opposite occurs because light falling on the photocell reduces its resistance. Current passing through the photocell shuts off the amplifier, which shuts off the sensitive relay, which in turn shuts off the power relay, and the lights go out. The time delay unit between the amplifier and power relay serves as an auxiliary power supply to keep the amplifier turned on for up to a minute and a half after the ignition is shut off. This auxiliary supply comes from the taillight circuit, and thus it depends on a chain reaction to keep going. While not shown here, the time delay depends on a charged condenser that leaks down through a variable resistor attached to the knob. When the condenser has discharged, the chain is broken and the lights go out. The manual on-off switch, shown behind the time delay, is operated by pushing or pulling on the control knob. When the knob is out, the switch is off, and the Sentinel system has no connection to ground, hence it cannot operate. When the knob is pushed in, the switch is turned on, and the Sentinel goes to work. However, to make certain it is working as it should, we have a few quick preliminary checks that will show whether the system is working. Make sure the manual headlight switch is shut off. Then, push in the Twilight Sentinel knob to establish automatic control. Now, turn the ignition switch to accessory position. In a normally lighted shop, the Sentinel will usually turn the lights on. Shining a flashlight into the photocell should cause the lights to go out. Covering up the photocell should cause the lights to come on. If bright light has been falling on the photocell, the system normally waits a few seconds to see that it's not just a temporary condition, like driving through an underpass. 
Now, keep the photocell covered and check the time delay by turning the control knob all the way to the right to maximum time delay position. Turn off the ignition switch. The car lights should remain on from one to one and a half minutes. To check whether the lights come on at the right degree of twilight darkness, we use the separate test bulb plugged into the analyzer at voltage output and set the knob to position one. Connect the power supply clips at the fuse block and a good ground under the dash and run the engine at idle. Turn the voltage control all the way up so the test bulb is fully bright. Put the car lights out by holding the test bulb tightly over the photocell. Slowly back off the voltage knob until the car lights come on. This should happen between five and a half and two and a half volts. Now turn up the voltage to put the lights out and this should require an increase of one to three volts. If so, then the original factory calibration is still okay. By dropping the lower steering column cover to get at the amplifier harness connector, we can use the analyzer as a voltmeter if further tests are required. Connect a jumper wire from the lower cover to a good ground under the dash and ground the analyzer's negative power supply line too. Do not hook up the positive feed wire. We won't need it in the voltmeter circuit. With a short piece of stiff wire clamped in the alligator jaws, plug in the red wire in place of the test bulb and go to position one with the function selector knob. Probe with the stiff wire to make contact with the black wire terminal. This gives us a check on the photocell voltage output. Now, the voltmeter needle should swing in a wide sweep when you shine a flashlight onto the photocell. If so, the photocell is okay, and any problem must be in the wiring or the amplifier. And so we close the story of The Private Eyes, Twilight Sentinel and Guide Matic, the twin electronic guardians of the 64 Cadillac lighting system, and their wise, all-knowing companion, the Guide Matic Analyzer, a trio in the best Cadillac tradition of faultless performance in the service of the owner and the know-how to keep it that way. Yeah.